going. Uh, we have a uh, select gathering today. Um, so, although we've got more people joining fairly rapidly, um, so let's hey. attempt to do a roll call of uh, who people are. So, um, I'm Tim Rivet. I am from Artig, and I'm your chair today, Amy. Hello. Yep. Uh, Amy Brown, Open Data Platform Manager at Traveline. And I'm going to go down the list in order on my screen. So that takes me to Mr. Barrett. That's you know, yeah, Ian Barrett, Lancashire County Council, one of the principal transport officers. Uh, Dan. Yeah, Dan Saunders, Head of Products at Basemap. David. David Barrett from Ticketar and no longer of the Kent RTI system, which has been closed down due to um, age, redundancy and bugs. OK, uh, Josh. Yeah, uh, Josh Goodwin from dustimes.org. Uh, Keith. Uh, Keith Willis, uh, re uh, React. Uh, Mike. Yeah, Tim, uh, Mike Nolan, Customer Experience Manager at Travelline. Thank you. Uh, Mike Baxter. You confused me there. <laughs> yeah. Mike Baxter, uh, Transport Development Officer, Leicester City Council with particular responsibility for RTI. Uh, ben. Hello, Ben Murray, Product Manager at KPMG for Odds. Nick. Uh, Nick Carey. Uh, with Teresa in DEF 153. Uh, Peter. Peter Stoner from ETO. Uh, Rob. Rob West from Illidium. And Teresa. Oh, I'm trying to leave my lunches off. Hello, uh, Teresa, note taker. And DEF 152. Oh, yeah, two, and that too. Three. Same with Nick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you all. Um, I suspect we probably most of us probably knew each other anyway, but uh, it's always worth uh, making sure. Um, so, um, apologies. Have we got any from anybody? One from Justin, but welcome, Ben. I think. Yes. Hello, yeah, Ben. Ben was here and he's gone. Oh, was he? Oh. Yeah. Maybe you'll come back in. Yeah. Um, oh, hang on. There's a Stephen. Hello, Stephen. I haven't got you down. Hello. Yes, it's the, it's the first time I've attended this one, but I do recognise a few names uh, uh, yeah, from previous. So hello to everyone. Hello. Where are you from, Steve? Sorry if my... I will, I will turn on my camera. Oh, there we go. Hi. Nice. Yes. Yeah. I, I, I work for Arup um, in the Intelligent oh. Mobility Department. Thank you. Um, Excellent. Welcome. Thank you. Indeed. Um, so we've got Justin from VIX um, with apologies and also the Rail Data Marketplace team who were going to be presenting today originally, but uh, uh, for personal reasons are unable to attend today. Um, so there's an action, I think, Teresa, for me to add to uh, make sure that they get invited to the next meeting mm -hmm. to talk about what they're up to um, in the world of rail data. So if there's no other apologies, the minutes of the last meeting um, hopefully you've all got them. If you are not on the circulation list, drop your email into the chat and I'll add you in um, afterwards. But they're on the PTIC website. Um, in terms of um, 
actions, Ben and Dan, you were going to uh, talk about numbers of uh, service codes registered and things like that. Don't that whether... definitely did not happen. <laughs> OK. <laughs> yeah, likewise, the uh, sharing uh, those numbers um, because uh, I'd forgotten to uh, get them from Ben. So if we carry that forward, Ben, if we, I mean, if, if, if those are available regularly, the, 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 you know, numbers of people signed up and proportion of expected operators signed up and providing various bits of data, then that would be good to get those on a regular basis and we can circulate them. Yeah, um, we, they're not available through the website. They are a manually created um, set of data for now, which are um, consistently updated. So they are, there is an up-to-date data set, but um, ISRI's team manages that. So um, I can work with ISRI to, to share that with you, Tim. Um, perhaps we can have a, a chat between us just to make sure we are giving you exactly the data that, that we need to need to give. Yeah. I'll set that up. OK, excellent. Thank you. Uh, and then um, another one, you know, popular Mr. Murray. Um, <laughs> you were going to talk with Nick Truscott about um, Cornish uh, data. We did have a chat. Yes. It, is, is Nick on today? Um, uh, no. no. Yeah. Um, we did have a chat and we've been keeping in touch by email since then as well. Um, and, and Nick is making great progress on the um, on the amount of services that require attention in Cornwall. And um, there's, I don't know if you want me to go to, into some details on, on how that discussion is going, but, uh, but yeah, that's that's working well as a as a as a mechanism for helping that that particular local area of the country. OK, um, is that replicable is what you're doing with him replicable so if there are other areas that have got problems with numbers of services and things like that is that process something that could be repeated yeah i strongly believe so um and there are different ways for us to to address that um but um yeah i i feel like it's it's something that we do want to replicate and um We've been talking with um, Andrew Varley from ATCO to see how we could help to reach out to the different local authorities, because um, in some cases it, w it will be a different type of engagement. But uh, but I think that initially that conversation with the with the local transport authority lead would be um, and we can take it from there as to as to the best way to to help because in some cases it needs a conversation with each of the different operators and some in and in some cases that subsequent conversation can be held in in different ways um, either in a group setting or one-to-one -one bilaterally between the local transport authority and the operator or um, as a as a three-way conversation between the the bots team and the local transport authority and the operator or in a big group face-to-face -face setting so but but it all starts from that initial discussion uh, with nick it it was straightforward i could just talk to nick talk through all of the operators talk through these situations and nick can kind of take it away and take it from there um, but that won't what happens after that conversation what happened with Nick might not be the same thing that happened with all, each of the other local transport authorities, if that makes sense. Um, but certainly that initial discussion to talk through what the situation is and then agreeing what the best approach would be is definitely replicable. Excellent. OK, so if if uh, there are authorities that know that they've got operators that are not providing data then I guess get in contact with you or with Isri? Um, I think um, I'd like to get Isri to join on these sessions but um, mm. in Isri's absence please contact me um, and then I can um, either have that conversation directly with you or set up that discussion with Isri um, but we can yeah we can we can move that forward um, either way either both of us are able to uh, to help with that with that process. Yeah. But I can I can make it happen one way or the other. Um, but yes, please reach out to me. Um, and we are planning to actively reach out to each of the different local authorities as well. Um, 
uh, each of the different teams, um, each of the different local transport authorities as well. But if you contact me first, then that's that's ideal. Yeah. OK, excellent. Can, um, I, can, you, can you just just remind me what that's like? Is that all to do with people, pods, things missing from pods, is it? Yes, that's Sorry, right. I, yeah. OK, sorry, I, I, I got distracted by a work, a work issue. So, yeah. OK, no worries. Thank you. For, thanks for that. Cheers. And could you just, if you're happy to, could you just pop your email in the chat and I'll make sure it's in the notes if you're happy for it to be there. Yeah. Lovely, cheers. And I think that was the last of the actions. In which case, uh, is there anything else on the minutes of the last meeting that anybody wants to talk about? No. OK, in which case, uh, bus open data service um, progress and uh, updates um, we got for uh, fares and disruptions. Um, Stephen uh, Penn is not around for this meeting, but we've got an update from Emily Ostridge from um, KPMG in a bit. She's not available um, until half past, so she'll pop in and we'll have it then. So we might play around with bits of the agenda and things like that. Um, but um, to start with um, routes and timetables and location data, Ben. OK, I'll just get my screen ready. I make it full screen. Yeah. Does that look okay? Yeah, that does. Great. Okay. Um, this first slide is a repeat, but I'll just, um, it hasn't changed, but I'll just talk through it um, a little bit. So um, we're focusing on, on data quality with BOD. So we are standardizing it and uh, helping to make it complete and timely and accurate all across the country. Um, this in turn will help passengers plan journeys, find the best value tickets um, and get real time service updates wherever they are. Um, so um, data quality and measuring that is is where our focus has been recently and is likely to be for the for the foreseeable future. Um, so I'm going to talk through about some of the releases, some of the um, uh, updates that we've been making to the to the to the BODS service recently. And um, in the next slide, I'll talk a little bit about what we've got coming. Um, so. I gave an update in in September, um, which which talked about some of the changes and improvements we've been making to the different ways that we that we measure things like how well timetables data is matching to um, AVL data. Um, and also we measure completeness um, and the completeness reporting that we do is through three different reports. We supply it as a whole in our timetables data catalog. And we supply it to then a custom version of that for each operator. So for each operator, we list all of the services that we can see that are registered with the with the OTC. And we um, we summarize those and we summarize whether they are published to BODS and whether they are um, up to date. Um, and 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 so these reports were generated for the first time earlier this year. And the first release that we did, the naming convention that we used hadn't really changed very much and they were a bit of a mouthful um, some of the some of the field names were things like um, effective date of the um, OTC um, um, expiry um, and so th they were not really plain English they were functional and it helped it helped the testing team make sure that they were um, testable um, and they did the job but they were a little bit not not they weren't plain English. So we've been um, updating and refreshing all each of our catalogs, the um, the timetable data catalog and the local authority catalog and also the operator catalog. And these have all been updated and refreshed. And on production now, you can see hopefully a much more intuitive 
approach to, to the naming convention and the and the language that's used in these so that you, you shouldn't have to phone up somebody and and have someone walk you through and say what does it really mean um, there's likely to be further improvements that we can make but this is this is something that we that we are, are really pleased with and it would be really helpful if we can uh, have some feedback to see whether these these do make sense um, and so yeah as i say there's there's one main one that you can find in the in the um, overall data catalog and then for in each operator profile or in each local authority profile page you should see a custom report as well that's that's hopefully very easy to read and very easy to understand um, so this is um, I think something that's important to enable us to improve the quality so that users can understand where those quality issues are and what they mean. Um, so those changes are ready to see. Um, I'll just mention briefly um, that what's to come, whilst these reports currently only include the registrations that have imported being imported from the OTC, we are working on the registrations that are managed elsewhere. Um, so we have been working with the Weka team and we can connect to the API and the development team are just about to start to integrate with the Weka registrations and to import those. And, and then we'll be working with um, TFWM, TFGM and Hertfordshire to enable these to be imported too. So we're working on these as a priority and there's, there's a, a variety of different means that we'll be, they'll be using to, to import those. Um, but for now, it's just the OTC. In January, we're expecting it to be um, also including the Weka ones and, and subsequently to that will be the, the other ones that I've just talked about. Um, PII removal and prevention. So um, just after the, um, um, the September uh, update, we said that we would uh, part of the plan was to implement the removal and prevention of this data. So in the trans exchange files, um, it was it was made uh, apparent that um, in some cases there were there was some um, potentially some some details in there that could be potentially um, uh, identifiable information. And it 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 pointed at the um, the, the path of the um, of the user's computer that had generated the trans exchange files and sometimes the username was there and sometimes that username was the name of the person so um so we've we've now carried out the exercise to to analyze all of the data on bods remove it and prevent any of that data being published um, um hereafter so um so that exercise is now completed um service summaries is something that um, i'm really um, excited about we've just deployed it to to production and it's something which is the it's the first step of improving the way that operators and local authorities um, can and agents can inspect the data that has been published so what this means is that we are um, when a trans exchange data set is published we will scan the data set for all of the license numbers that are that are present um, and for each license number that is present within that you will see the data for each of the national operator codes that are um, included in the, in the files that are published and then within that you can see all of the service numbers that are present um, and so um, this means that you can kind of lift the lid on what is inside your trans exchange files at least start to do so um, so it means that you can within your data set you can inspect to see are all of the services that i expect to be in there actually in there um, and we will follow that up with a more detailed inspection of each of the um, each of the uh, data sets that apply to in each individual service but i'll talk about that a little bit more on the next slide but what you can see now on production is a is a nice accordion view it's called in gds speak for um grouping the um the data that you've that you've included in your in your zip file that you've published to bots um flexible services is something we've been working hard on this this last quarter um, we are now able to um publish flexible services files to bots and a validation report will be generated so that you can see if there are any issues. So it might be that your booking arrangements are missing, or it might be that you're not really using the right service classification. Um, so we will be able to validate your, your flexible services files. 
whether it's applied on its own or with additional unregistered services. So we've made the we've made the system a bit more tolerant of the way that data can be supplied so that you can supply a single transit exchange file that, that describes a registered flexible service along with unregistered standard services that that complement that flexible service. So this data can be published and you will receive a validation report in full. However, um, there is more work to do with the way that we present a summary of your flexible services files. And it's it's being done off the back of the service summaries that I was talking about. So we'll talk about that, that in a bit more side as to what's to come next with flexible services, but that's what we've that's what we've done now. And so um, for those operators that are working with their technology suppliers to to generate flexible services files you can you can throw it at boards and see how healthy it is and see see how well that um see how well that data um meets the uh, the requirements of, of of tim's documentation and um uh, to wrap this up we've been improving um api um user experience so for new users that that come to BODS and are interested in interacting with the API, um, some of the ways that you can query it have not really not been clearly described, in particularly the bounding box. Um, so we've improved it by supplying what an example looks like for Liverpool, rather than just presenting the um, the query parameters. We've we've given an example of how to fill it in. Um, it, it's not so intuitive without that example. So we're hoping that that example enables new consumers to quickly get up and running and provide custom queries to BOD so they can get the the data about a specific area uh, really easily. So um, in the next slide, I'm going to talk more about what we're doing next. But any questions on what, what I've just covered here? OK. Next is a short summary on what we're focusing on next. We'd, these are the main highlights. Um, I don't want to take too much time here, but also we might shift priorities around a little bit and we might not necessarily do it in this order. Um, but what I've been talking about is to enable the data quality to improve on bonds is to enable that inspection um, to be done, to enable accuracy to be validated. So the best person to say whether a data set is correct is the is the person that created it and, and is the person that uh, is running that service. So we're providing a, um, a data set summary that will um, list a, and we're going to iteratively improve on it and, and add to it, but uh, a list of, of high level metadata about the the service um, that we can see that has been published. Um, and um, initially it will be a map that is just for that service. So at the moment you've got a bit of a spider's web map on VODs with all of the services in that data set and that can be a little bit difficult to, to understand how to make use of it. So we're going to be providing an individual page for each of the, each of the services that are published um, and so you can see the map just for that service and some metadata just for that service. So things like the start and end dates that we can see, um, the, the locations that they serve, the service organisations that are in there um, and um, we'll then move on to provide a printed timetable format okay. for, for that data as well so that you can see all of the um, journeys on any particular day so you'll be able to select from a date picker to see what um, what journeys are running on that day depending on the files that you've published so it might be you've published a selection of files some for monday to friday some for term time some for non-term time um, and so depending on whether the day you select from the date picker is a monday to friday or a weekend day or a term day or not depending on all the different files that you've published we'll then visualize the journeys that apply to that particular day and um, and this should help an operator to confirm that the the data is is as expected um, this work was required um, this individual data set summaries page was review it was required in order for us to be able to present the flexible services data because um, the flexible services data that's published in a zip file that contains loads of services it's not helpful to present that in a single data set page so we identified that we have some additional work to do to make it a bit more granular so that we can provide an individual page for a flexible service. So uh, for those that are keen eyed, you will see that we wanted to do this sooner than February. We wanted to do this um, before the end of this year, but it's been there's been a bit more work involved with that because of the granular approach that we're doing to presenting for presenting data. 
Uh, but nonetheless, the team are making good progress on it, and we, we, we're hoping to make that available very shortly so that within these individual data set pages, you can see this summarised data, both for flexible services and for standard services. And for a flexible service, it's going to be really interesting. It's going to show the zones that are included in the data. Uh, and when you've got a combination of zones and fixed stops, um, it will present that in, a, in an easy to understand way. And we'll iteratively expand on that um, to show things like um, the um, the the times at which this, the flexible service is operating. Um, um, but out of the box, we'll we'll describe how to book it um, and 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 what the uh, what the zones look like on the map. Um, and what we're also looking at is line level completeness. Um, so with this line level summary um, for all of the data sets, the, all the files that have been published in those data sets, um, it means that we'll be able to move to a stage where we can look at all of the lines um, and see whether those have been um, accurately published. And that we'll be, we'll be doing that for fares and for timetables. Um, it's something that um, it requires that line level understanding of the data. So this we would also intended for this to get um, done before now, but I think that this this approach that we're taking puts us in a good place to um, to not only present all the data that you've published but all, for all the, the lines, but also all, all the lines that we expected to have been published as well. Um, so to help the operator come to ensure that all of their data is completely and, um, and accurately represented on pods. That's it. Any questions from anybody? Um, it, it, you don't have to raise them now. You can contact me directly if you'd like. Um, but if, if you have any questions now, I'll be, if I've got time, I'll be happy to cover. Peter. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Ben. I'm just going back to the the bots catalog. I was just wondering whether are your the changes that you are making are going to be complete um, uh, and stabilized. Uh, we do look at the bots catalog and make automatic sort of reading of it. And each time that you make a change, we <laughs> our processes stop and we have to investigate what's changed with a file heading. So it'd be very useful if this would be. Uh, are not subject to frequent changes. Yeah, um, thank you. It's it's a really good um, point. We we do try to keep it both st stable and um, but also improve slowly over time. Um, what I would suggest is that um, I have invited um, some of the ETO team to our sprint reviews. We we hold open sprint reviews, which um, anybody in this group. Would be very welcome to to join so that you can have a look at what we've been doing over the last sprint and what we're planning to do on the next sprint um and we've been talking on these um about all the different changes that we intend to make so this might be a good way to give you a heads up of changes that are coming so it doesn't come as a surprise um uh, so that you can get that visibility of the changes that we're making and the changes that, that we're planning to make but but yeah with these with these fields um yeah we deployed them earlier on in the year and and i think this is the first um major change to them um but but yeah i appreciate that every time we do this there will be will be an impact so we try to keep it as stable as we can um so i can certainly appreciate your comment but yeah i would urge you to um and, and your team to come along to the sprint reviews they are open for all stakeholders to give us feedback on how well we're um going how well we've been delivering what we uh, and designing what we're what we're working on and help us to identify what is the most important work for us to work on next. So we'll often give a heads up on what we're planning to work on over the next sprint and the coming sprints. Um, and it'd be great to have your um, your voice on that to help us make sure we're going in the right direction, but also get a sneak peek on on, on what's coming next. Thank you for that. Yep. So Ben, the work you're doing on um, the completeness for lines uh, 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 at line level, presumably will also help with the location data checking at some point to make sure that all the all the right data is in the Siri feeds as well. Um, there's a bit more to be done before then. Um, but yes, um, completeness for location data is something that's really important to us. And we're really um, not measuring that as well as we'd like at the moment. So we, we do a sample check at the moment of the data that we receive, and we'd like to expand that to a more complete check. Um, but there's a few steps that need to be, need to be done before we can do that. But you're right, understanding what complete looks like at a line level is the is the first step to enable us to to measure that. Yeah. OK, Ian. 
Yeah, just a quick one. I just missed out on a few PTIC meetings recently. Uh, going back in the day, there used to be a group held meeting held at um, the FT about BOS in general. I'm just looking, just thinking with some of the developments that uh, Ben's talking about. How's any input into changes being uh, made available or suggestions being taken up? Or is there no scope anymore for it? having these these groups, industry groups, actually involved in the development of a product which seems to have uh, taken over quite a variety of things. So it's just, doesn't need, it shouldn't be a closed shop, but it needs to be how you get input into these and why they're not open, is it in an open discussion that these changes are being made? Um. A couple of things in, in reply. So I, I think that um, the types of meetings that have been held for BODS have changed over time. Um, but the programme board is something that has been restarted recently that has a variety of stakeholders in there. And um, and I, I I think that Triumph would be would be happy to uh, to include you in that and to give you um, another way of seeing what we've been working on and, and what the team are, are thinking of working on. Um, but um, the um, the BODS principle is to really develop out in the open uh, and we really want to have as transparent a process as, uh, as, trans as transparent a process as possible and it'd be really important for for your voice and others to influence the direction that we're taking the order that we do things um, so as product manager I'm keen to make sure that I, I take all voices into consideration um, and yours would be it would be very important so um, as I say, we have these sprint reviews um, that that you'd be very welcome to um, to join, um, and the program board meetings that we also have as well. Um, and we had an ignition event earlier um, in the year, um, and we'll be holding others of the repeats of these two around the country, um, which will be another opportunity to uh, to to contribute to the to the direction that Bolt is taking. How do, maybe I'm being dense here, but how do people know when these are being held or how to access them, Tim? Is there some reference to this on BOD somewhere or is there is there a secret door, the secret key? No, I'm teasing. <laughs> yeah, there there is a secret key to the to the to the BODS board, <laughs> I guess, and Triumph is the one that holds that. Ah, um, I see, okay. So, I'm just wondering the offers there for people to say do they want to join in. But I mean, is. in the meeting, in the notes, can we can we give any help other than yes. find someone and chat to them? Basically, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, ba ba basically, it's by invite. So yeah, include Triumph's email address in in the notes, and uh, I'm sure it'll be happy to uh, to add people into the uh, into the invitation list. It's already uh, quite a significant list. Um, and uh, even if you can't attend, you you there is a slide deck um, that's that's shared, so you get to sort of see what's going on. Um, is there any scheduling for when they happen at all? Um, just broadly, I, I, not for me. I'm just thinking for others. It's about quarterly, of... I think, isn't it, Ben? Yeah, I think it's about right. Yeah, yeah. It's not um, monthly. It might be bi monthly, but yeah, I think it's quarterly. Mm, yeah, mm, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, Triumph is the best person to uh, to contact for that. Um, and then for the sprint reviews, contact me and I can make sure that the invitation goes out to you. Um, and then for the ignition events, we had one um, earlier in the year and it's quite a, a good number of people. I think we invited about, about 40 people and, um, and nearly everybody turned up but we can extend that to be a, a bit larger to about 50 or 60 people um, and so um, if you it, if you would like to be included in those um, then that would be the BODS team again that, that can that can help to make sure that you are included in that um, but I think it's a good idea Teresa to have somewhere that someone can see the uh, the different types of events that happen and how to get involved. Um, yeah, yeah, because so, otherwise yeah. it's you're telling us, which is great, but it's just like, yeah. oh, okay, <laughs> when have I just missed one? What, yeah. What, yeah. What, what am I looking at? Well, sort of thing. We'll, yeah. we'll endeavour to, to to get some of them, um, some information on them on the PTIC website, um, which would seem like a sensible central point for it, given that we've got quite a lot of BODS content on there already. Um, so yeah, the, the the groups that are that are held and where to 
to get involved. While we're talking about that sort of thing, before we come to, to Mike and his question, um, some of you will have seen uh, an invitation to um, an event that was supposed to be next week. We've had to cancel it, unfortunately, um, Looking, which was uh, for local authorities looking at um, what bods might look like in future um, because the contract that KPMG have got um, expires in probably about 15 months time now, something like that, um, and needs to be re-procured. Uh, and so the department's starting a, uh, an engagement process with people to work out what the future requirements should be. Um, as I say, that one was cancelled. Um, there will be some, and that was that was going to be a face to face. There's going to be some uh, online sessions in the new year asking the the, the same questions that were being uh, addressed at that event, um, and there'll be some uh, work with uh, operators and uh, suppliers, both those that are doing things with operators to supply data, so scheduling systems, suppliers and things like that, and data consumers as well, because your your wants and needs will be different. Um, so there'll be a series of events early in the new year in January and February to, to capture some of that, um, to, to work out whether that should be included in future procurement um, for, uh, for, for BODs. So, yeah, there's going to be quite a bit of um, future thinking going on uh, early in the new year. Um, ben, uh, not Ben, uh, Mike, sorry. <laughs> Hi, um, I, I hope um, you don't, it doesn't matter. Um, it, I have not had as much chance to use BODs as perhaps I should have done because uh, I've been sort of meshed in the nitty gritties of real time information at a system level. And, um, one thing I'm conscious of is the BODs, um, where does the responsibility lie for ensuring the correctness of BODs? Because uh, obviously you've outlined all these tools and uh, different views and different mechanisms for looking at the data. And as a local authority, presumably I should be able to see information for all services in my local authority area. But um, in terms of getting, you know, if there's things that are wrong and whatnot, who, how does it tend to work in other areas in terms of report? Is, is it the operators or, you know, the, the, I guess there could be some areas where people are really hot on things and everything is really kept pretty, pretty damn up to date. And other areas, perhaps at my area where we, you know, there's certain areas of BODs that are, that are not, not as up to date or as correct as perhaps they should be. I'm just wondering, is, is there any sort of measure on, on, or, or impetus on, on on making sure of that yeah it's a good question and it's there's a short answer uh, um and a, and a longer answer but the short answer is it's the operator's responsibility um and so um that's where the responsibility lies um however um we find that there's multiple ways to motivate the operator to meet their responsibility um, and so Therefore, we tr we try to make the completeness and the transparency, uh, sorry, the completeness and the accuracy and the timeliness of the data as transparent as possible, so that anybody that is interested in the data being complete can see what the state of it is, and then can um, either support the operator or 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 reach out to the operator to uh, um, to either point out the deficiencies or or to help to to complete those deficiencies. So uh, what we find is that um, making it as transparent as, as possible means that um, local authorities, where they're able to, can have a look, as you say, to see what the health of that data is, so that they can then contact that operator and say, um, do you need any help in this area or that area? Um, and it's a live view of how healthy and how complete that data is. Um, but it's only really um, um, a means to an end to enable the, the operator to meet their meet their responsibilities. Um, so whilst enforcement agencies are looking at it and will and will take action, and in some cases they they have taken action action against operators, it's 
it's uh, it's a long process to follow um, and there might be operators that you're interested in in your in your area um, to see how well they're doing so that you can inspect that and either reach out to the BODS team and say what's going on with the operators in my area the data is not good enough what can we do about it and then we can develop a plan with you on, on how to address that and that might be a um, a bit of a, a town hall session to get them all in a in a room and, and have a talk about it or it might be one-to-one -one discussions with them so there's different ways to approach it but lifting the lid on it and measuring it and then deciding what to do about it after that is 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 what those reports are for right okay but you don't necessarily have a have an appreciation of like certain areas where the, the lid is being lifted and is being really used to its full extent and other areas where perhaps it's not um, well, each local authority has its own um, page at the moment. And on, on these pages, you can see how many, what percentage of the services require attention. Um, right. And so that's that's one way to quickly quickly look um, at, to see how yours is doing compared to others, for example. Um, and, um, and I can give you a quick tour uh, either now or after the call. Um, to, to, to show you how to find that. Um, and um, what we're also doing soon in the timetable data catalogue, we'll be adding additional an additional couple of columns that will be um, so that you can filter all of the services that belong to either to an individual local authority or a region of the country um, so that you can see how complete um, and, and accurate the data is for um, either a local authority, local transport authority, or um, a combined authority, or a whole region as a whole, um, as well, to see how how those are doing, so they can stack be stacked up against each other um, to get an idea of where there are issues. And I think this will help. This will help various teams. Um, but if you're interested in your area, which most local transport authority teams are, um, I can help you to with a you know with a conversation to help you understand how to look at. What is what is relevant for your area, um, and and talk you through how to how to address those uh, problems that we can spot. Okay, all right. Well, maybe that's something for outside of this meeting. Once I've got, yeah. got my head around it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Ben. Okay. Is there anything else on routes and timetables and location? No. Nope. Okay. Um, fares and disruption. Uh, we will do when. Emily joins us. Um, Ben's touched a bit on flexible services, um, but um, I have a plea for people. We're in this catch-22 situation uh, with flexible services where I've been approached by a number of suppliers asking for data, for example data rather than uh, that's that's not the sample files that are already been made available from other suppliers so that they can test their imports and uh, check what they're doing uh, matches what everybody else is doing. Um, and um, I've had requests, I've not had any offers to make that data available yet. So we're in a bit of a catch 22. So um, please, if you're producing, um, some flexible service data um, to meet the, uh, the the profile requirements. Uh, please let me know, and um, I'll uh, share them with those that have asked. If you need some confidentiality and things like that, then uh, we can deal with that. I'm sure. So yeah. Um, OK, um, so as I say, we'll pick up disruptions and fares in a bit. Um, the WESH bus data service, um, I'm not quite sure where WESH is, but the Welsh data service update, um, unfortunately, um, <laughs> um, Mark isn't able to attend today. Um, but he has uh, given me an update for you on that. So this is the Welsh equivalent of BODS, which they went out and procured uh, earlier this year. They've uh, progressing with it uh, quite rapidly now. Um, they've got predictions uh, being generated and they're working through that 
the process of analysing those and testing the predictions. Um, they've got stop level Welsh language data being sent out by the uh, Welsh bus data service. So bilingual stuff. So if you mm. need to test uh, some bilingual data, then I'm sure that um, if you get in contact with Mark, uh, he will be able to share that. Um, sorry, sorry, Tim, can I just interrupt there? When you yeah. said it, it does predictions. So the Welsh data service, yeah, it's, it's not the same as BODS. It's a Welsh oh, national right. system. Um, and that's why, that's yeah. why I was, I was put, <laughs> putting in, because it because BODS doesn't do predictions, does it? No. No, right, OK. No, no. But the Welsh version does. Um, they're in the process of having a NAPTAN editor developed, and that'll be ready early next year. So all of the Welsh authorities will have a way of managing stop data more effectively, um, which will be a big win for NAPTAN. Um, and um, the as part of um, their service, again, something else that BODS doesn't do. Um, so they've got the predictions. They also have a content management system for displays so um, displays in Wales can connect to that and get the data that they need um, that's uh, sh scheduled to be testing in early next year again um, and the initial implementations of that where the displays will be talking to the to the Welsh content management system will be in Cardiff who are in the process of uh, upgrading uh, existing displays and buying some new ones so that will be uh, first used in Cardiff so the Welsh uh, service is, is developing quite rapidly at the moment by the sounds of it mm. very much so mm. so um, you, did that's... you say there's a NAPTAN editor as well on that um... they will have NAPTAN editor yeah as part of the national um service yeah which we don't have in you in in england either do we not at the moment no 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 um okay ben's, ben's disappeared already i think oh right yeah it was meant to be <laughs> three o'clock <laughs> yes yeah yeah, he's just. Uh, I'm just no, off video. Back. I'm I'm still here. <laughs> oh, <right. laughs> he's just putting his Christmas jumper on. Now I've no idea. Yeah. Okay. Um. Any questions about the Welsh service? I'll do my best to answer them. No. Okay. Um. So. Travel line, um, Mike, you're, you've got a board meeting where various things are going to be discussed uh, next week, I think it is, and you're going to provide yep. an update after that. Um, but is there anything you, you're able to say at this point? Nothing. Uh, just looking back on the previous meeting, Tim, nothing further to update there. There's, like I said, there's a few um, points going to the board next week for decisions, so we'll have a more meaningful update following the 14th, so we'll provide a written uh, feedback to yourself and Teresa to circulate with the minutes. Uh, but if anyone's got any questions, then more than happy to field them while we're here. Uh, Ian? Yeah, just a quick one on travel line update. Is uh, just checking in terms of Christmas... Uh, data processing and we, have, we haven't been in touch with travel line for a while is it still on the same basis that the it's a process once a week type thing on a wednesday or a thursday uh, just a confirmation of that because as i say we haven't been in touch with travel line for quite a while so just christmas dates and the uh, frequency of um, processing if you don't mind yeah, no problem. And uh, we do feel free to jump in at any point. I think for the North Northwest Consolidating Service that we do for yourselves uh, in, in that part of the world, that yes, we do still do that once a week. We do process TNDS now four, five nights a week. Uh, so Monday through Friday, we uh, run automated processing. So we've started receiving Christmas data um, already for a number of regions. Uh, we'll be processing right up to the 
twenty uh, second uh, when we'll break for Christmas. Um, the automated process will run uh, throughout the Christmas period. We won't be in a position to do the consolidation service uh, for yourselves until then in the new year. So that last week before Christmas is is our kind of final dates for processing. Uh, but we'll be doing general updates uh, in between. As we're a small team, we will be on emergency cover basis on the days in between Christmas and New Year. So if there's any issues, one of us will be in uh, for the three days in between uh, Christmas and New Year. Other than that, it'll be as we were. Amy, is there anything you want to add? I uh, don't think so. Just that there should have been a, an email circulated to all the uh, local authorities for the Northwest Consolidator with the, the sort of dates on. Terrible. If you haven't uh, had that, I'll... Uh, I'll send you a copy. Um, but yeah, it's basically just what Mike said, but in an email <laughs> form, uh, just letting you know what, what the last dates are and um, yeah, when the processes are happening. So I'll, I'll send that to you if you haven't, uh, you should have had it, but yeah. No, I haven't I'll had it yet. No. Okay, okay, cool. I'll, I'll send so. you a copy. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Yeah. Um, having raised the uh, the Christmas um word and talking about christmas data um for those of you that are eagle-eyed and processing christmas data um in the last few years um there have because christmas or one of the christmas type days has fallen over the weekend um the um alternative movable um extra christmas days and new year days and things like that have been used um this year's the first time for a number of years that we've not had um any extra days um and um certainly having looked at some of the christmas data and talked to um a couple of data consumers um i think we have a bug in data formats and things like that um that we need to address um for christmas data i mean there's there's all sorts of problems with christmas data and uh without opening that pandora's box there is a particular problem with these um christmas day holiday in trans exchange and new year's day holiday uh, as examples of two of them because they're not being used um there are no services operating so you set those days as not operate as as journeys not operating on and um for a few services that do operate on boxing day and christmas day and things like that you end up in a situation where the trans exchange has um for the 25th and the 26th of december for example journeys off being marked as operating and not operating um and under the precedent rules um you use non-operating days in preference to operating days to allow you to deal with school holidays and all of those sort of things which happen on a regular basis but there's a situation where you've got christmas day operating and christmas day not operating um and so I'm sure everybody that's been doing this for a number of years has worked this out and has rules in it that go. But if it's this, don't <laughs> don't do <laughs> don't do that. Um, but there is a bit of a problem for people that are first starting to use some of this this data where you've got. Yeah, by rights, things that should that that, that are actually running might be marked as not running. Um, in imports and things like that. So we need to work through that um, because none of those extra days are being used for the next three years, I think it is. So uh, it's worth sorting out. Um, but one to watch if you're consuming data. Peter. Yeah, I was just wondering where we were up to on the slight adjustment we discussed for Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve. We we've got quite a favourable uh, discussion, I thought, around um, trying to make it perpetual. Of course, this year, people have got to move their Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve from the Saturday schedules to the Sunday schedules. And if you haven't done that, 
you will end up getting Saturday services running on Christmas Eve if you let that go through. The We were trying to make it so that you only had to mark journeys that were not operating on the holiday, on, on the eaves. And in that way, you can mark any days of the week and it becomes perpetual. You don't have to adjust it every year. Um, it would be very helpful if we could get that um, in place. I wonder where we're up to with, with that. Uh, no further on than we were um, when that was last discussed um, at the start of this year. Um, th th there's, there's, I think, as many views on, on that and options for um, dealing with that. The more you talk to more people. Um, so it's not particularly simple, but we are going to have to open the box to deal with these movable days. Um, and so um, let's aim to sort that out as part of that to see whether there is a, uh, a, a real way of doing it that has decent industry um, consensus, a bit wider than the group that um, met in January last year. That'd be excellent. Thank you. Mm. OK. Um, any other questions for Mike or Amy on Travel Line stuff? No. OK. Um, so um, EU standards development. Um, not a lot to update, which is why there isn't a uh, paper like there normally is. Um, the work on the historical and performance data standard opera is starting in detail um, next week. Um, so uh, that will end up with a the equivalent of NetX and Siri for historical and performance data, the big gap in data standards, really. Um, and the plan is still to have something done for um, sort of the end of the summer 2024, something like that, to be testing things um, in draft. Um, and there's a number of suppliers that are lined up and keen to be doing that. Um, so that's good. Um, and during the course of the year, I'll be running various things to test um, use cases and, and examples and things like that. So hopefully version one ends up being pretty use, usable rather than the normal um, trying to implement something and finding it doesn't work. So that's in hand. Um, everything else, all the other standards, there's not any real change to talk about. Um, there's bits of work going on, but nothing um, earth shattering enough to go through. Um, there is a new um, standard being talked about at a ISO level, so rather than a European level, a worldwide level for uh, destination displays on bus. Um, being led by the Indians who want to standardise um, LED uh, displays on the, you know, on the front and side and, and back of the bus. Um, so if you have an interest in that sort of technology or using them to provide information, let me know and um, I will um, quite happily get you involved in that because hopefully it means I won't have to. Um, <laughs> otherwise, I will have to by default. Um, <laughs> but and, and I only have so many hours in the day. So, yeah, if you have an interest in displays on the outside of buses, let me know. Um, any questions on 
EU standards stuff. Nope. Um, I see that uh, Emily has joined us. So welcome, Emily. Um, Thank you. So I suggest we jump back to fairs and disruptions. Yeah, sorry about um, having to join late, but a <laughs> very short update or a quick update from me. Um, did a couple of slides just so we've got them um, and I'll share my screen and talk through them. Um, is that coming through OK on the fairs? Yeah, that's fine. Brilliant. Um, so in terms of fairs updates, the BOD's NetEx profile um, version 0.1 has been sent to key SMEs um, for consultation. So we're just waiting for feedback um, from those individuals um, and the plan moving forward will be to incorporate those amendments and suggestions um, and then also work to complete the complex fairs profile um, before that's then sent out again for consultation with SMEs and then wider industry consultation once we've incorporated that feedback. So simple fairs is out at the moment and then complex fairs will be worked on once the feedback's in for that. Um, and that's the main update on fairs. So a very quick one from me. Do does anybody have any questions on that before I move on to disruptions? No. Well, oh, oh, Dan. Yeah, no, I've got a quick question. Um, do you have an idea on the kind of uh, level that's provided for simple fares and what's, you know, how many are being provided at the moment to, you know, out of the total ones that are provided for kind of uh, schedules and timetables? How do you mean, sorry? So how, how complete is the fair, the simple fares kind of supply from bus operators? As in to bods from as percentage wise? Yeah. Oh, right. OK. Um, I don't have the figure to hand, but I can definitely find that out for you. OK, that'd be great. Yeah, no problem. I'll just make a note. Um, we, 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 we tried using some a little while ago and we were getting very, very poor kind of coverage and match up uh, between the scheduled and the and the fares as well. So I was really intrigued right. to know. If that was kind of naturally consistent, that was just a, something in a small area I was looking at. Yeah, no problem at all. And it, um, is that compliant first data or non-compliant and compliant for the minute? Um, I think it was. I think we're looking at compliant data. Um, yeah. No problem. Yeah. Um, let me take that one away, and I'll um either drop you an email or I'll let Pib know, and you can pass it on. Um, That's great. Thank you. Best. Brilliant. Um. All right. Perfect. Any other questions? On fares or shall I move on to disruptions? Yeah, move on. Yeah, no problem. Um, so disruptions, a little bit more to say about that. So the disruptions tool, there's been a new uh, operator accounts feature that's been released um, for the tool. So what that means is that it's a local authority driven tool, but um, we had feedback from some local authorities that they also wanted to have operators involved in the process. and that's now a feature so a local authority can onboard an operator account um, to their organisation for their area um, and that operator can create disruptions for their own services um, or operator wide consequences so they're not able to kind of close a bus stop for example through disruptions but they are able to say that their service um, can't run or their service at a specific stop can't run and um, so that's a new feature that's been released very recently. Um, for planned work, there's um, we're currently working on integration with Street Manager um, to allow users to create disruptions from the roadworks data that's coming through from Street Manager. The um, idea is that we'll present the data from Street Manager to a local authority for roadworks in their area. Um, they'll be able to see a bit more detail that's come through from Street Manager and then on the basis of that detail they'll be able to create their own disruption with some of the elements pre-populated using the data that's come through from Street Manager. So it's almost like a notification system for a local authority where they can have that overview of the roadworks that are happening, um, make that decision whether that's going to impact a bus stop or a service that they know about um, and they can kind of use that as an additional flow to create the disruptions data through the tool. And then the final piece of work, well, that short term is being looked at is um, visualising the disruptions data on BODs through a map. So it's currently 
um, being shown through an API and you can um, download the data from VODs at the moment. But the idea will be to have a page per local authority. And when you click onto that page and go through, you'll be able to see uh, an icon for each of the type of disruptions that's on the map um, from the disruptions data um, and see a little bit more detail from that from a VODs perspective as well. So yeah, that's the update on disruptions. Any questions? Presumably, if you're an operator and you want access to the to that tool, you go through your local authority. Yeah, yeah. So um, we would expect the local authority to kind of manage the operators that do or don't want to be on the tool, rather than it being on our end. So are we saying that the tool's already available and local authorities should be aware of it and be able to do something with it? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And if you're interested, we can set up a call and I can give you a demo or we'll get you set up on the pre-prod site. I'm not quite sure I said that, but yeah. OK. okay. <laughs> Sorry, no jumping to conclusions. But yes, the tool is available to be used now. Right. OK. I think we've got a call coming up anyway. Right. Fair enough. Thanks, then. Yeah, just to follow that on then, is there any proposal to link it with operators who are already sending Siri through their Siri systems, SX? Is there any proposal to link that in to the bots or whatever? Because we know one of our operators, yeah, they're very good at counselling journeys, etc. But that would then need duplicating one in order to cancel it on bots. So is there a proposal to do anything like that? I believe there are discussions to have um, third party Siri XX data kind of, I'm not sure whether that'll be directly through BODS or whether it'll be through the Create Disruptions tool and then fed into BODS that way. Um, but I know there are conversations happening around that. I'm just not sure specifically what the work would be or what the plan is with that. Okay, okay, okay. thanks. Sir. Okay, any more? In which case, thank you, Emily. Thank you. So um, that then takes us on to um, uh, European ITS directive. Um, so um, we've had, or we've had, because it's European, we don't have any more. Um, there was a uh, ITS Intelligent Transport Systems Directive um, that uh, was uh, originally agreed and in place from 2010. Um, and this is a pan European country directive, so you can rely on it in all of the authorities, and it provides a framework for. Um, the original one for connecting vehicles, roads, assets and other transport uh, things together um, and outlines um, how data should be formatted and set up and, and the standards and the interfaces that should be used. Um, and things like NetX and um, Siri fall into that on the road network. Datex 2, which some of you will have come across. Um, and, and so an awful lot of things fall, have fallen out over the last few years of the ITS directive. And it's one of the reasons that an awful lot of uh, data has become available across Europe and in the UK, um, it has to be said, um, as a result of it. Um, and um, on a day to day basis, you might go, is this, you know, was this an, a, a, another directive that, that nobody actually sees on a day to day basis? Um, if you drive and have bought a car in the last couple of years, um, you will have um, got either a, re a red button that will either say SOS or e-call in your car. Um, so 
new cars since 2019, I think it is. Um, legally, you have to have this in Europe and in the UK. Um, that comes out of the ITS regulation, um, the e-call, that if you get in an accident, if the airbag's deployed automatically, makes a call to emergency services, um, or you can press the button and get through to emergency services. That's a real practical thing that um, an awful lot of people have seen coming out of it. Um, other things, um, the information on um, um, variable message signs on the motorway and trunk road network, they're all available through um standardized interfaces across europe and um the uk um real-time traffic information so um that falls under that along with the safety stuff and um the multimodal traffic travel information service um regulations that that come out of the its directive um cover things like um, the way that a package tour company provides you with um, refunds, um, all of the airline delay um, payments and things like that. So, you know, if you're delayed more than two hours, they have to provide you with food and drink and, you know, um, uh, give you money if you've been delayed more than however many hours all of that falls out of this so it's so you know it's not just one of the directives that sits there and and you know you're not quite sure what it what it does it's it's impacted an awful lot of what we do specifically you know with a petic sort of view of the world um the um creation of um the access point databases across Europe, so all of the stop databases and rail station databases um, that are available at a national level. Um, we already had NAPTAN, um, so we didn't see that coming new, but for um, pretty much all the other European countries, that was new. Um, sharing of rail data across borders and things like that, that falls out of the multimodal travel information services regulation. So actually, it's been really quite powerful. Um, the um, There's a revised regulation that was uh, agreed at the end of October, and more details been coming out during November on the wording and things like that. Um, a couple of important things to uh, think about from our point of view. Um, it takes what was there already and uh, expands on it. So um, it's going to mean that countries have to provide multimodal information, um, not just rail and road. So bus and tram falls in into this for the first time. So uh, uh, equivalents of BODs are about to be set up in other European countries to support this. Um, people are going to have to provide uh, booking and ticketing services um, and make those available to third parties so you can do some of the things that we've been doing in the UK for a while, you know, you don't have to go to the train operating company to buy your ticket. You can go to a, a third party and things like that. Um, that's going to help um, enable facilitating booking of journeys and things like that and making that more widely available. Um, it's going to mean that people that have got um, by shared bikes so you know the higher bikes that you can get and scooters and things like that make their data openly available to people in standardized ways um, and that's going to be uh, based on trans model architecture stuff um, so much more interoperable than um, it has been um, 
there are quite a lot of arguments about that because most of these uh, scheme, most of the bike and scooter schemes use uh, the uh, GBFS, the uh, general bike um, standard that's the their version of GTFS. Um, but at the moment, the way that the 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 regulations worded, they've got to use the trans model um, standards. Um, it's going to try and deal with um, vehicle and infrastructure communications. Um, so you know, as cars get more automated, things like traffic light priority, um, speed restrictions and things like that um, are going to need to be digitised as part of that. Um, so speed limits, roadworks, things again that we've started to get used to having so street manager um for roadworks which is the dft introduced um a few years ago now um uh, that sort of thing doesn't exist in a lot of european countries it's going to have to um going to need not just rail and trunk road data being made available it's going to have to include all of the multimodal um stuff again we've got that already through bods and matan for buses they're going to have to do that over there and um more road safety information um and so um some of the things that um are starting to come out are the program that's covering at least the next five years. Some of the stuff at the moment goes up to years six and seven for rollout, um, partly because member states have up to two years to enact the regulation as law. Um, and so if you've got a five year implementation program, it needs to uh, go on a bit more than five years after this lot's been published. Um, but there's bits of uh, essential data, which I think we might be quite interested in with a with a public transport view of the world. So the speed limit stuff, the road closures and road works and things like that. Um, and whilst we're not subject to it in the UK, um, the UK government has clearly been keeping an eye on this. So things like the um, um things in the king's speech uh last month it was last month wasn't it now king's speech um about um um road traffic orders um being done digitally and things like that that's sort of absolutely essential to be able to to deliver a lot of this so you know that's things like when you put in parking bays on the side of the road and cycle lanes and things like that. Historically, they've been done on bits of paper, so they're going to be done digitally. So, you know, vehicles consume that and back offices can consume that to help cars and public transport know, you know what's there on the road network. Um, so, yeah, so there's quite a lot of stuff going on, um, fleshing out um these regulations at the moment into things that are going to be practically implemented um we're not in europe anymore um so is it relevant um yeah it is because pretty much all of the challenges are similar to the ones that we face in the uk unsurprisingly um and um we do benefit from um a very significant amount of funding that goes into the work to support the implementation. So all of the development of standards like the NetEx work and the Siri work over the last couple of years has been preparing for this. So um, the work that was done on accessibility um, and the European profile on accessibility uh, is critical for the new regulations. Um, we get access to that 
a lot of the work that's going on in NetEx um, over the last couple of years about um, new modes and alternative modes, scooters and um, cycle hire and things like that, um, comes out of preparing for this and the work that will be happening. Well, Nick Knowles is deeply involved in it at the moment. Um, working out how to do bookings um, in NetEx so you can um, use NetEx to, to share uh, booking data and things like that. That's all critical for uh, implementing the revised regulations. So we do benefit a lot from the work that goes on to support the ITS directive, even if we're not subject to it anymore. And the work on uh, education and training the data for PT, which I've talked about before, does that's all part of getting people ready for uh, the updated ITS directive. Um, so, um, yeah, we gain a lot from it. Um, and uh, there'll be a lot more detail coming out over the next six, 12 months. Uh, on what it means and the things that need to happen to uh, to enable it. Um, and so uh, I will inevitably be keeping an eye on it and uh, let you know uh, how it affects us and what we can gain from it. Uh, anybody got any questions on ITS directive? OK. That then takes us to how on earth do I stop sharing? There. It's moved in the new teams. <laughs> I'm a technophobe <laughs> increasingly. <laughs> Don't know how to do things. Um. Right, OK, so Bus Centre of Excellence, um, it's nearly a year since it was set up um, and uh, it's doing quite a lot at the moment. Um, its programme of training is starting to build up, um, so um, keep an eye on um, the, the website or more probably more usefully actually join up um, and get on their newsletter mailing list so you get to hear about them a bit more in advance because, for example, on the 12th of December, there's some face to face training on how you might improve bus accessibility um, with some uh, very knowledgeable and experienced people um, providing that training. Um, and then uh, in January, there's stuff on driver recruitment um, and there's a series of webinars uh, on things like uh, bus data um, and how you might navigate around that, which I am comparing um, and a session on bus priority. So all useful, good stuff. Um, that's something that anyone can, any of us lot can get involved in. Tim. Yep, 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 yep. Sometimes there's a little bit of a cost, but the webinars, for example, are free, um, and the accessibility training uh, is free. So I we just find that the train on the, fare to London. Uh, find that on the website for Bus Centre. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, it's definitely worth signing up and getting on their newsletter. Um, and if you're looking for a different role at the moment, uh, they're currently looking for uh, the head of Bus Centre of Excellence role at the moment in the process of recruiting. So if you fancy a change of scene, uh, fancy making a real difference because it has started to, to do some really good stuff, uh, and make a difference in uh, lots of areas. Um, yeah, become the head of uh, Bus Centre of Excellence. Uh, any 
questions on the Centre of Excellence? No. OK, um, there are no new issues raised on any of the standards. Um, does anybody want to raise anything now? If you come across bugs or problems with standards, then um, on the PTIC website, there's a form to fill out to raise things formally. And in which case uh, that takes us on to the next meeting. Um, can I can I can I just um uh, yes, Mike. Can, um, you know what you were saying about the um. Sorry to to show my my um lack of knowledge or um, lack of insight into this area, but are you able to spend just a couple of minutes explaining this about the 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 difficulties over the Christmas data? now or i know you tried to do that before but is this something i should be worried about uh it's more for your suppliers yeah who might be consuming the data to make sure yeah. that they get it right um so are you saying that if for example uh, a, an operator is running services on boxing day it might be a problem this year because Boxing Day is well, just I, I didn't know if I quite fully understood everything about when you were saying Chris, Christmas, what, the, the, the stuff that uh, Peter Stoner was talking about as well. Can, can you explain that to me a bit a bit more clearly? Sorry to. Uh, yeah, so let me. Sorry, just... I, I hope people don't mind me hijacking this. I just thought it might be. A, a timely just little five minutes yeah 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 so you yeah it's that certainly it's you, you're right it's probably worth getting into uh this a little bit let me just uh grab some because i think you're saying that because um, christmas day um is right. not at, not at the weekend aren't you because it so effectively christmas day yeah so in, so in the last the, the last few years we've relied we because for example christmas day has been um at the weekend um the christmas day holiday which is the movable bank holiday day that allows people to have a day off work um picks in um there's always the the Christmas Day holiday has always had a date other than the twenty fifth of December, but this year um, we find the the situation where um, because for bods you have to provide every bank holiday and say whether it's a day of operation or a day of non operation. If you, for example, set Christmas Day holiday as a day of non-operation um, and Christmas Day itself as a day of operation. How do you decide whether it's going to run on the 25th of December or not? Um, and the trans exchange specification says that um, days of non-operation uh, get precedence. So actually, the uh, Christmas Day holiday would override the Christmas Day, even though we don't actually have a Christmas Day holiday. Um, and that is the problem. So most of the suppliers out there at the moment um, have added in uh, extra little bits that have gone uh, in this situation, ignore the day of non-operation or ignore Christmas Day holiday. So it doesn't become a problem, um, but it's taken some people a little while to, to twig that this is why they're getting uh, some strange days. It's not going to affect that many services because um, there's not many services that run on Christmas Day, Boxing Day and New Year's Day, um, but it will affect some. 
So are you saying that if, if we've got services that run on Boxing Day, for example? Yeah. It might be a problem. Yeah. 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 Talk to your supplier. They've probably dealt with it. Or your data consuming suppliers, I should say. So whoever's providing apps, websites, real time systems, that sort of thing. So and this is because the the Boxing Day is 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 really Boxing Day and it's not an extra day. Is yeah. It? So. Yeah. 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 And what was the business about the um, the Christmas Eve and bank uh, and New Year's Eve that Peter mentioned that um, it would be. So they really are Sunday? they are on sun they are on Sundays, aren't they now? Right. Well, they are this they are this time. Um, the 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 challenges with those runoff days. Um, you need to go in. Um, yeah, thanks, Dan. Um, you need to um, change your data each year because the day of the week that. The runoff occurs changes, so um, you know some journeys will operate on Christmas Eve, for example. Um, and um, as Peter said last year, it was a Saturday, so you had to mark those that weren't operating um, as not operating or going and and say Saturday isn't operating. Um, if you've not updated your data this year. Um, they're going to show as running because today this this year is a Sunday. Um, so if you look at the uh, for that one, that's quite a simple. How do you deal with that? Because we issue a guide each year on what you need to do in different um, systems um, to um, make this work properly. So there's a RT and PTIC document that gets issued every year. Um, that that goes into you know warning people about this and includes what you need to do in uh, ticketer in um, trapeze and omni uh, the bigger suppliers and systems where you're creating and managing your raw data to get it right. So there is a guide on that one um, that we've issued for the last three years i think it is can i add uh, so, so i think uh, just looking at some data this morning uh, i was noticing just how much how many operators have a gap nothing running on christmas eve or christmas day and it's not just because christmas eve is a sunday service it's because they haven't positively set the christmas eve to run on the journeys that will be running on Christmas Eve. And this is this is the added burden that I, you know, that we discussed last time that is really unnecessary. If we dispensed with that requirement to mark all the journeys that are run on Christmas Eve as running and just had the requirement to mark all the journeys that are not running on Christmas Eve, it'd be a lot easier for everybody because you'd only have to mark the not running and you could leave those not running for the other days of the week as well from year to year. It just wouldn't have to be adjusted every year. So this year, as last year, we've got to make a change. Of course, once you make the change for next year, it'll be for a Monday and you're probably all right for a, for a good five years, actually. So. <laughs> Um, but on the other hand, if we could get this approved before people have to make the change, they'll make the change and then they'll never have to make the change again. So it's worth trying to discuss it as quickly as possible and get this to prevent it becoming a, um, a, a thing in future years. So are you saying that the, we, we could be, if the data from certain um, operators into, so say, the VIC system that Leicester uses, so if it comes from particular operators with particular uh, scheduling systems, there could be some errors, say on Christmas Eve or New Year's Eve, whereby there perhaps is no services showing as running when when there actually are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. If they've if they've not gone in and updated their data, 
and they've just gone oh i sorted out what was running on christmas eve last year and and i'm doing you know not running anything after six o'clock again and you know they go well i did it sorted that out for that last year i don't need to do anything this year but actually they do so that could be a so right and then this this uh, guidance you're talking about that's the bait because that the problem we have is is like getting them to do anything about it so if we can't get them to do anything about it we've got to bodge the data ourselves haven't we uh yeah this guidance you're talking about is it available yeah it's it was published uh i don't know up, back in october um so i'll put the uh, link to it in the chat I would suggest a quick way is to have a look at some of your uh, city centre stops and uh, see whether you've got a reasonable number of services. Say you look at the be in, in, in Google Maps if you want, look ahead and um, see whether you've got a reasonable number of services for um, Christmas Eve. If you have, you probably your operators are onto it and it's, it's all right. If you've, if you've got a big gap, think, oh, right, let's investigate further. OK, thank you. Sorry, I think I've probably jacked this a bit too much. OK, any more on Christmas while we're okay. talking about that? No. OK, um, so next meetings, I've proposed a set of dates for uh, all of next year. Um, I've tried to avoid the obvious conferences and event big events and things like that but uh, if i've missed any let me know um but otherwise that's when we will be meeting next year and i'll get them stuck up on the website and eventbrite stuff sorted out in the next couple of days and so that then takes us to any other business No. OK, in which case, uh, thank you all for your time this afternoon. Um, and if I don't see you or speak to you uh, this side of Christmas, have a very good break uh, and a good time and see you all on the other side in the new year. <laughs>